Hello everyone and thanks for joining the third webinar of New Ways of Teaching and BBEL Professional Development Webinar Series for English language teachers. Today's webinar is called The Benefit of Teacher Development for Your Daily Work and Career Plans. This webinar is part of um, a British Council program created specifically for educators in the Americas called New Ways of Teaching that promotes ongoing training for those involved in the educational process. So, are you a teacher? Are you a school leader? Are you a policymaker facing the challenges of ongoing changes in education? Visit the New Ways of Teaching website. Graham Stanley will be sharing the link of the website in the chat. So please explore all the wealth of materials, tips and ideas in distance learning, on student motivation, increasing verbal participation, lesson planning, teacher well-being and more. Podcasts, there's a new podcast, the latest on hybrid teaching. So please visit and listen to it among other podcasts. There are video tips in three languages, Portuguese, Spanish and English. Webinars, the two previous webinars, the recordings are already available in the website. Research reports and more. So if you want to keep updated on publications that are to come, sign up for the New Ways of Teaching newsletter. The link for the newsletter and for signing up for the newsletter will be shared in the chat. Another announcement before we get started with our the introduction of our, of our special speakers. There are more webinars to come. On the 28th of October, Climate Change in English Language Education. In November, remote teaching online learning. In December, gender in English language education. And next year, January, the big BeBelt conference. So if you want to sign up for the coming webinars, please click on the link in the chat later on and register for the coming events of your interest. Another thing before we move on. Stay with us for the certificate of attendance. There's a link that will be shared after the question and answer, and then you click on the link and you will receive or read the QR code and you will receive your certificate of attendance. So without further announcements and further ado, let me introduce our speakers today. We are very happy and very honored to have Gary Motterum with us from the UK. Gary is a senior lecturer in the School of Education at the University of Manchester. He designed and led the pioneering MA in Educational Technology and TESOL, which was the first established in 1990s and which employed early online and blended learning methods. He conducts research in language teaching and technology and on teacher education and technology. He managed the Manchester-led consortium for the eChina UK project the EU funded Avalon project and understood research with Cambridge University Press, exploring teachers' uses of technology across the world. He has recently completed a project on teacher professional development through practitioner research in Côte d'Ivoire and has been exploring the ways technology has been employed to support refugees and asylum seekers in their online language classes during the pandemic. We are very pleased and honored to have him here today. And Gary will be producing some infographics for new ways of teaching and a final publication. So hello, Gary. And maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit more about this work that you'll be doing for new ways of teaching. Yes, hello, everybody. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to be part of this webinar. Um, yes, I'm working uh, with colleagues in, in the Americas and I'm uh, following each of the, the different webinars uh, and um, making notes and working with uh, a, a graphics company uh, to produce uh, for each of the events to, to produce an infographic. Um, and at the end, I'm also going to be producing uh, a report uh, that will be shared uh, at the BeBelt conference that's going to occur in January. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Thank you, Gary. And now let's introduce the other speakers today. Maria Jose Galeno has been teaching English since 2003. She is currently the educational technologist at St. Brendan School 
and she's a British Council online moderator. She is very much interested in the application of technology in the classroom with a meaningful purpose and in the application of real professional development in teachers. She holds an MA in Digital Technology and Communication and Education from the University of Manchester and other MA in TESOL Teacher Education from the same university. Welcome, Maria Jose, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Our third speaker is Fatima Taha. Fatima Taha is a CELTA holder. She is the founder of the online platform IELTS and More. She's also a teacher at Al Azhar English Training Center. She has been working in the field of EFL as a teacher and teacher trainer since 2009. Fatima is both a British Council and a Yatafo blogger. She has published a number of articles of ELT and magazines such as MET and presented in a number of international ELT conferences. She's interested in experimental practices and online teaching. Welcome, Fatima. Thank you for being with us. Hello, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Great. So let's first start with the first question for our speakers. The first question about professional development is, Gary, can you summarize your professional development road? It's a big road. It's a long road, isn't it? <laughs> 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 yes, I suppose it is a long road. I've, I've been in the profession a very long time and uh, certainly uh, I've uh, was been interested in pursuing professional development since the very beginning um, when maybe I kind of realised when I first got into teaching um, that uh, I didn't know very much about it. So a lot of my early uh, professional development was related to uh, actually taking courses of, of various types and I have a mixture of qualifications. And the other thing that I did very early on, uh, which I'm very pleased about, is uh, I, I joined uh, a prof teacher professional organisation um, and that's been very helpful uh, for me, uh, both in terms of the opportunities that it's offered in all sorts of ways, uh, to, to working as a volunteer with them, uh, running sessions and doing all sorts of other things uh, around the profession, getting to meet lots of people um, at, at conferences, both local and, 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 and more national conferences. And the other thing I suppose, um, the other thing that, that I did was I became a, a teacher developer myself. And I think that's also been very influential because uh, it's had a, a massive impact on making me think about about how uh, I actually uh, begin to work with other teachers um, and need to, to remain up to date and follow up things myself. So yeah, it's been a long road, but I, you know, I, I, I've done it throughout my period as a, as, a, as a teacher developer. So, you know, both through qualifications, particularly through joining a professional organization, but also through self-development. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, some of those um, areas a bit later. So now I'm going to pass over to uh, Maria Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I guess in my case, um, you know, my professional development road, first of all, it hasn't ended. I strongly believe that uh, professional development doesn't end until life ends pretty much. Um, I'm a big fan of, um, I tend to be very eclectic. I like a lot of things. So in my case, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to have to be, have been able to be uh, completed like formal uh, professional development. I was able to do two masters and I'm extremely um, happy about that. Um, and of course, one of the things that helps, has helped me a lot is also that drive that I naturally have in order to learn for more. So I'm constantly wanting to learn more. So one of the things that I've done is, um, as Gary like joins different associations, I've also uh, joined different uh, Facebook groups and things that help, you know, to be able to understand and, you know, see what's happening around the world. Because I do live in a very, um, I live in a small country in South America. You know, um, we don't have much contact with uh, other nationalities. We're not 
So one of the things that I do a lot is Facebook groups, you know, all the different groups that you have out there. Um, and of course, working with the British Council has opened my horizons. Um, you know, I've been able to go tr learn a few things. So it's pretty much a road that has taken me from one place to the other. That's why I think of the long and winding road. And because it is goes one day will go this way, but I know that because of my eclecticness, I might go in a different way. But as long as you are growing, I guess that's probably how I would summarize my professional development. OK, and what about you, Fatima? What can you tell us? Um, hello, Maria. Hello, everybody. So yeah, I've, uh, I've been teaching since 2009 and that's almost 13 years now. Um, but then uh, the first six years of my teaching career, I was just teaching from the heart and because there was almost no turnover in my classrooms, the employer was happy. But then in my classroom, I never knew the difference between, you know, uh, listen planning and the stages and understanding learners and all these kind of stuff. I was, uh, I felt it, I, I understood my learners and everything, but um, there was something missing, something that I noticed my other colleagues were able to do in the classroom that I wasn't. So um, I was quite blessed later on uh, to join the British Council joint project with Al-Azhar University, which is, the, this is the picture that you see in front of you here. This is called the Al-Azhar English Training Center. And uh, in this place, I got my first qualification, which is teaching knowledge uh, test. And then maybe later on, I thought that's not enough. I want to learn more. So I went into the American University of Cairo, of Cairo and Toby Feld. That's the fundamentals of English language teaching. And if you're from Egypt, you would definitely know this one because it's that thing that pushes you into uh, teaching uh, as a novice teacher and then uh, I thought still it's not enough. I'm not satisfied. I want to learn more, uh, get more certificates. And that's why I say that um, um, I, I, I have this professional development syndrome or disorder. Like uh, I see I see a course or I see any professional development opportunity and I feel like I have to jump on it. That's why I took the CELTA. Uh, so 13 years now, teacher, teacher, trainer, blogger. Um, I feel that I got like you, like you, Maria, that eclectic taste and I'm still experimenting and I feel like you that uh, learning as a teacher uh, is pretty much uh, a lifetime long journey. Thank you. O over to you, uh, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, Maria Jose and Fatima for sharing your professional road for your enthusiasm and the profession. Um, and well, let's go to the next question. Which is. How do you manage and promote your continuous professional development during COVID-19? Gary. Well, uh, in terms of uh, during COVID-19, of course, um, I mean, I have a background in in distance education, so uh, it was in some ways it was a sort of natural process for me. I felt sort of very vindicated in terms of the the, the work that we were doing, uh, and, and and of course immediately turned uh, to the kind of social media uh, that that both Maria Jose and, and Fatima talked about. But I tended to use more localized media rather than Facebook, although I do. Use uh, LinkedIn quite a lot these days, um, and have tended to work around small groups um, uh, uh, that, that are based pretty much around WhatsApp. Has certainly been a, a focus of my research for a number of years. So uh, I, I then, I mean, I continued <coughs> to engage with a number of what are often referred to it, it, as communities of practice. So small groups relatively small groups of, of teachers. Uh, WhatsApp is limited in terms of the numbers that, that, that it will allow. Um, and this has mostly been for me in, in uh, or during the period of the pandemic in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So West Africa in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, um, in, in countries like Senegal, uh, Benin, these countries, because this is where, where, where I've been doing work. So I continue to do that. But I also 
uh, reached out to uh, my sort of favorite organization, uh, the Learning Technology Special Interest Group of IATEFL, um, and I attended uh, webinars, um, and I also gave webinars as well. I gave some webinars. I, I got contacted by a number of people uh, to, 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 to actually conduct webinars to sort of present ideas uh, that I was working on. And uh, another uh, way that I uh, kind of continue to, to professionally develop was to, to, to re-look at my own materials. So we were in a, a very different situation um, in the work that, that I've done at Manchester University. We suddenly had a mixture of, we have a distance learning program, a traditional part-time distance learning program, um, but we, we also, we were suddenly in a position where we had full-time distance learners uh, at the same time. So, you know, re-looking at the, the way that, that we present uh, our materials and the interactivity that we engage in, rethinking the use of uh, both uh, asynchronous tools and, and synchronous tools. So all of that, you know, adds to your professional development. What tools are going to be more effective for doing these things, trying out new ways of, 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 of uh, organising uh, online activity and so on. So looking at new tools and bringing them into to, uh, the work that you do. And the final thing that I did um, was uh, was to, to bid for project work. Um, again, maybe that's something that not everybody, um, you know, would normally think of doing, but, but there are often, you know, small grants that you can apply for to do some sort of activity. And this was something we did. So we work with some local teachers um, who work with refugees in, in our community in Manchester. And and we we work together with them again, looking at ways that they could, uh, you know, enhance the work they do. Particularly because a lot of the uh, the teachers that we worked, uh, we were sorry, the, the students we were working with only had mobile phone access. So we we're looking at the sort of complexities of doing online activity with them. So actually bidding for that project then doing the reading around it, talking to the teachers, interacting with them, again, helped me with my own professional development. So kind of, uh, you know, the, those are the sort of different elements that, that, that uh, I certainly engaged in during that period and, and I'm still engaging with as well. So, so again, pass over to Maria Jose. Thank you, Gary. Wow. Um, first, I accepted, um, reluctantly, of course, uh, I had many plans to for nine, 2019, um, you know, 2020, sorry. Um, I had loads of plans. I was going to do some more formal education. And I, once the pandemic hit and everything was online, um, I kind of had to stop and get reorganized myself. So one of the things that I did, like Gary, um, I'm used to working online. But my energy comes from because I'm also a face to face teach school teacher still. I still te teach at school and of course I have I still work online for the British Council, but I needed um, you know, to reorganize myself. So what I accepted was that I decided that I'm I was going to stop. I wasn't going to be as ambitious as I was planning on being. Um, so I did some MOOCs, some uh, MOOCs from Future Learn, which are fantastic. Uh, those are the ones that helped me. So I still felt that I was doing continuous professional development. I didn't, uh, but I didn't have the time or the energy to complete uh, more formal work. So I decided to postpone that. And well, as of this year, I am, I feel that I, you know, things are a little bit calmer and we'll be able to move on. So um, I think the pandemic in that sense made it a detour in the sense that I was going to be less strict on myself, um, you know, we sometimes teachers, we're busy teachers, just like you, you know, we work, we have a life, you know, it's very hard to everything that we do, plus include our professional development. So I decided and all of this changes of, you know, from face to face to online as the learning technologies at school, I was, you know, the first few weeks I had loads of work for me to do. So in that area, I felt that I needed to calm down and just focus basically on my teachers, on my professional development up into a certain level. And in that case, that's what helped me a lot. And just because it was a detour doesn't mean that I, I stopped. And I think that's the most important thing. We shouldn't stop professional development. It's just maybe we don't do it as intense 
in certain periods of our lives and that's okay as long as just make sure that you know don't feel that you need to stop take advantage and keep growing what about you fatima how did how did all of this affect you <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I feel as lucky as you are guys because I I also had previous knowledge of online teaching by happy uh, by happy chance. I had a year of online uh, teaching beforehand uh, before the pandemic hit. So and I was actually, you know, uh, trying to uh, tell other teachers about it in conferences. Uh, I was giving webinars and conferences uh, presentations about teaching online before the pandemic hit and uh, lo and behold three months later just you know everybody turned into online learning however uh, because of you know the fact that we are teachers and teachers are, are what I like to call people persons so we like to interact with the human beings we like uh, we like people in general that's why we're in this profession so um, I feel that cascading knowledge through vlogging and YouTubing was one of the things that I really enjoyed doing during that period. Uh, the impact that you could feel and see on other uh, novice and younger teachers uh, is quite powerful. It lifts you up. It's because it's because you're you, you're you're taking away from your normal classrooms. You feel alienated in a way. But if you try to engage with other teachers through your YouTube channel, uh, a Facebook page, uh, maybe uh, like a Telegram group, uh, holding voice chats, um, that kind of thing does help a lot, especially with the morale and your feeling that you're you're adding something you're doing something it's not that you're just feeling useless now because you can't go into your classroom or that maybe your students are not that much into online learning because it's a new thing for everybody but still if you can just do that uh, i would feel that this is the, the thing that i enjoyed the most about the pandemic i feel it's i did enjoy i did enjoy those two years sitting at home and still talking to other teachers and influencing others and over to you, Alicia. Thank you, Fatima, Maria Jose and Gary. I think, yeah, you're right. The pandemic was a great opportunity to join communities of practice and do lots of uh, professional development activities. Uh, so thank you for sharing what you what you did yourself. Um, now let's go to the next question, which is what can novice teachers do? to take more effective control of their professional development pathway? And then what can experienced teachers do to keep their motivation in continuous professional development? Gary? Um, well, I mean, I think it's very interesting. I mean, what people are saying about, I mean, about the pandemic, I mean, in some ways it has been a fantastic opportunity for anybody who's interested in, in technology supported learning um, uh, it, it's been a fantastic opportunity, both in a sense to sort of say, well, we told you so and you've not listened to us all these years, but look how wonderful it can be uh, if you've got the access. And of course, I don't deny that, that you know, that, that we learned a lot more about uh, about issues to do with access, but it gave a lot of teachers both sort of more novice teachers, but more experienced teachers. It gave them opportunities to do things in in ways that, that they'd not experienced. And I think it gave a lot of uh, people who were, were young teachers um, because they're, they're, they're much more digitally oriented. It gave them a lot of opportunities to actually engage in ways that, that perhaps they'd not been able to do in, in their classrooms in the past. So I think it's important to, to remember that it, it wasn't all bad in, in, in some ways. But I think that in general terms for, for, for younger teachers, I think, again, that notion of linking. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, just within your school, just within other colleagues, linking with other colleagues in, in your school, it, it, not necessarily electronically, but sort of, you know, having sort of thinking about, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to sort of work together and do things. Um, I mean, one of the projects that's, that there's a link um, um, uh, in the, the materials uh, to a project that we worked on in, in Cote d'Ivoire. And these were a mixture of, of beginner teachers and, and experienced teachers, but they were doing uh, what we call inquiry based or action research projects, often referred to as action research, but uh, it's an inquiry led practice. Um, and 
you know, they were working with mentors. We acted as mentors for, for the more senior teachers, uh, but the senior teachers, the, the, the teachers, the more experienced teachers were working with uh, their, their young colleagues. So you have that interplay. So you know, as people get on within their profession, they maybe get uh, they're they're not so excited by by the, you know the, the the daily round of life. So actually working with younger teachers in that kind of way, you know, engaging um, you know in in new different projects uh, are, are ways to, to to keep people motivated. So I mean the other thing that I think that both communities <coughs> can do these days and build. And if you look on these slides here you'll see uh, it talks about a personalized learning network um, and uh, you know that the, the idea of linking to people who uh, you want to connect with so uh, you can find you know, I mean I, I use Twitter a lot for example uh, to to create you know a community I follow people who I'm interested in um, and and some people follow me and, and you get to know, so you begin to build this community. I mean, I know you can do this in, in other environments, but I find Twitter uh, very useful. And then as you find like-minded people, you can perhaps create a, a, a smaller network uh, on one of the social media tools, uh, like, uh, you know, as I say, like something uh, along the lines of WhatsApp or something like that uh, to enable you to maybe pursue that sort of thing. So, you know, so following people online, posting things that you're interested in, asking questions, asking for support um, and, and that kind of thing, I think is very helpful. And, and both novice and uh, experienced teachers can, can both do that. I mean, I, the other thing I would advocate is if you're not a member of a teachers association, join a teachers association um, and uh, you know, you might be just a local branch of the teachers association or maybe set one up locally, um, you know, at least so, so that you can meet. And then if you're a more experienced teacher, you can get involved in, in some of the, uh, the other aspects of it. So I don't know, I mean, one of the things I did was I ended up as membership secretary of IATEFL. It wasn't on my you know, list of things that I wanted to do, but it was, it was, it was an interesting opportunity. I mean, I'd done a lot of organizing of events before that. I'd been a newsletter editor um, and so on. So, you know, you develop skills in, in areas that you're interested in. So, you know, an, an organization like IATEFL has lots of special interest groups for, for different areas. So if you're, you know, you're thinking about a management route, uh, you can get involved in, in that kind of way and become, you know, a, a, at a more senior level. Uh, so it keeps you excited. It gets you connected with people at a senior level. So novice teachers kind of begin in a small way in their schools, but as a more experienced teacher, uh, you can work on different levels of the organization. You can maybe even eventually become the president of the organization. People do that. So ordinary members, you know, become you know quite senior, uh, quite influential people by by being parts of organisations like that. So it keeps you excited, keeps you interested. It makes those linkages between young, younger, and older teachers. Um, and I think those are the things that that, that 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 keep it going. So you know, you've got that mentorship role uh, as a as a more senior member, but you know, you, you're younger staff mentor you as well, your younger colleagues mentor you because, you know, they're bringing in new ideas uh, from the sort of courses that, that that other colleagues are talking about that maybe are new to you, for example. So so that to me, that interlinkage works very well. So and one of the things that I'm doing at the moment, at the bottom right hand corner of this slide is I'm working with colleagues at International House Manchester. And as a somebody interested in technology, you might not recognize what this is, is, but this is a virtual reality headset. So I'm working with International House Manchester um, and uh, we're doing, a, a, you know, they're doing a small project and I'm part of that. So I got that link through one of my students who said, oh, would you be interested in doing that? International House Manchester, you know, uh, are doing this work. So there's some younger teachers there who are kind of excited and doing those things. And I'm learning a lot for, from doing that. So as a more experienced person, I'm still gaining a lot from the organization and they're getting to do, you know, things that, that, that excite them in the classroom. So, you know, that, that connectivity allows you to do that. And the big kind of diagram in the middle 
uh, I think uh, Fatima is going to talk a bit more about action research as part of her, so I won't steal her thunder. So I'll pass over to <laughs> Maria Jose uh, to, to say what she needs to say. Thank you, Gary. Well, um, for novice teachers, I guess the first thing that we should be doing is uh, looking. Um, I mean, we've all been novice teachers and again, as an extremely eclectic person, I loved everything. So um, what I tend to do was it was like I need to look at myself in the mirror and see what is it that I'm interested in. So take the chance to think about what you are interested in and then that will help you to focus. OK, because this is one of the things that we need to be able to do is that really to make that introspective saying, OK, I'm into a lot of in, you know, when you're a novice teacher, everything sounds fantastic or everything sounds terrifying. It really depends a lot on, you know, where you are. So um, I won't also I won't either talk about action research, um, but <laughs> one of the things that it, <laughs> we're all into that, Fatima. <laughs> so um, but one of the things that helps me a lot is to focus on what is it that I'm interested in the classroom? In my case, it's always been uh, like the practical side of things, not so much on the theoretical side. So I've always been looking at, OK, focus on different things. And as Gary mentioned, g uh, when you join associations, when you join all these different, uh, you know, virtual groups, you learn and you find out that other people, other colleagues have the same interests as you. And then you're able to grow. You are able to, you know, we're living in a wonderful world of uh, information and which allows us to access all sorts of information that in the past maybe it was very difficult. I remember the, I, I still remember the first time I used YouTube, you know, uh, that was in the past we had to, to have our own recorder. So I remember carrying, you know, my, v, my small VCR from class to class. So these are things that nowadays everything is so much easier. We can access loads of information. So and it's not something that we need to actually do. So first of all is focus on what you like and keep that focus in mind. What is it you're interested? It doesn't mean that you're not going to be interested, that maybe things can, will change. It, it, it could change and your interest may differ from one to the other. My interests have surely changed in my experience working as a teacher. So. And that's perfect and that's normal because we are human beings. So sometimes, you know, things call, call our attention according to the different periods of the of the year and things. And this is basically what we need to do is sit down, look at ourselves and think, what am I interested in? And focus on that. And then move on to another thing. Once you are, once you have become, you feel that you're not no longer a novice. You're not, you know, you feel more experienced. One of the things that you can do is share that knowledge. You know, we have a, well, Fatima is a blogger. Uh, you know, nowadays it's a lot easier to share. You can blog, you can share through uh, different social medias. You can present in conferences. You know, we always want teacher practicing teachers to show what they are doing in those conferences. So when you are, as you become more experienced, one of the things that has helped me a lot is I felt that I wanted to share what I was learning. And sometimes we think I have nothing to share. Think about it in the staff room. When you listen to your teachers, you know, colleagues struggling with some things that you feel that and you think, oh no, I have a fix for this. Have you tried doing this? Imagine do doing that for hundreds of teachers at conferences. You know, we're all looking at a, of ways to help each other and this is something that really does help. So about let's build those communities, share your knowledge, you know, go to conferences, share on social media, you know, loads of teachers are there waiting to get some answers and maybe you are the person to give those answers to and that will help you motivate yourself. You know, there's no such thing as one way of doing professional development. There are many different ways. So, but I strongly think that sharing is probably one of the strongest and it keeps, I'm motivated every time I have to share, I get the opportunity to share with colleagues. And Fatima, we all want to know about it, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, I've been teaching for a while now. I feel like I'm. Uh, uh, well, I can call myself experienced somehow now, but I have never lost touch with my novice teacher. 
Uh, so if uh, Alicia, if you can just move to the CPD wheel, I'd like to share something with my fellow colleagues. Yeah, exactly. So uh, um, whenever I felt lost at the beginning, you know, of my uh, understanding of the idea of continuous professional development, CPD, the big deal, it was quite scary as hell to tell you the truth, because there there are lots of things, lots of things that uh, I just don't know where to start from. Do you hear me? Do you still hear me? OK, so um, I always turn to this CPD wheel. Uh, it's quite interesting because if you I don't know if you can see or not, but um, the, the the CPD wheel has got many things that as a teacher you should uh, be quite aware of and have that kind of level of integration into your classroom. So for example, planning lessons and planning courses, understanding your learner, uh, managing your classroom, knowing the subject that you are quite teaching, uh, or even integrating uh, you know, technology into your classroom, promoting the 21st century skills, all these kind of things as teachers were, were quite you know, obligated to know about. But what's interesting here is that you, you don't really have to master all these things uh, all at once, but there are, if you look at the wheel, there are four different levels of, um, you know, there's this awareness thing, then there is understanding, then there is uh, engagement, and there is also that integration part when you come that experience. So look at the CPD wheel, uh, find the area that as a novice teacher, that, that is the area that you feel that I need to know about this more. So you dig deeper, uh, you learn more, and the, the, the resources available online is quite tremendous. So the ELT community is quite kind. You can find plenty of MOOCs and webinars to teach you about designing lessons, about understanding your learner, how to manage your classroom, how to integrate 21st century skills. What is actually 21st century skills? How to integrate technology? So whether you are a novice teacher starting off, you look at the CPD wheel and you take each one of these and you try to self assess, understand where you stand from each part, each part of the CPD wheel and then dig deeper and find your niche. But if you are an experienced one, I guarantee you that there is one area at least that you still quite scared of challenging yourself and getting and digging deeper into it. You might know about it. You're quite aware of it. Like, for example, myself, I know about uh, 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 inclusive practices in classrooms. But once I had a visually impaired student, uh, it w I, I panicked because I absolutely know nothing about doing that. And so I had to, you know, it was a humbling experience. I had to sit down and I had tried to find how to do that and how to manage the student in the classroom with other students who are not visually impaired. So whether you're novice or experienced, the CPD wheel is your go to reference. But then again, if you are an experienced teacher and you've done this and you've been there and you're not really interested in other things, there is this here, which is the action research or the experimental practice uh, cycle. This is quite interesting because that is fun. That is loads of fun. It's you know, the, the idea is quite simple. Uh, the, the word uh, uh, research and action research is quite intimidating, so I like to look at it in a microscopic way. So, for example, imagine that you got an issue in your classroom that's that, for example, the students in your online uh, sessions, they're not really interested and they're not really motivated to talk and they just, you know, uh, maybe uh, open the mic when you ask them to. So there is a problematic area here. You dig deeper, you try to design an action plan and understand where is the problem? Why is this happening? Then take a step forward into doing this and then a step back to analyze and to evaluate. How did this go? Why did this thing here did not work well? And always, always keep in touch with your learners because they are your your uh, your guide. They tell you if you ask them uh, and if they feel that you're quite sincere in understanding them, they would tell you uh, wh where you went wrong with them or how to fix this. And then again, take a step into understanding and digging deeper. 
and then reflection and implementing the, the tweaks that you have done and then going back and doing the circle all over again. And like Maria said, it's uh, the idea of cascading knowledge and sharing that with other teachers can start from a cup of coffee uh, with a, a fellow teacher who just came out of the classroom and you're talking together. Do that whether you're a novice teacher or an experienced one because there is always something to learn. Um, uh, th there are lots of things that I would like really to say uh, about continuous professional development and I don't think we've got enough time for that. Uh, so I just want to end on a note. Be reflective, keep a blog, doesn't have, you know, you don't have to share it with people, but if you, you know, if you feel that maybe what you have been suffering in your classroom and found a fix for could be worthy of sharing to other teachers, maybe get into blogging for the British Council after you have set your own personal blog, go into vlogging, uh, YouTubing. Uh, the the opportunity is, is quite endless, so uh, I'll have to stop now. I know, I know, I have to stop. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Alicia. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Gary and Maria Jose for so many wonderful ideas for continuous professional development. I am, I completely agree with the fact that there are no things such as novice and experience. We all learn from each other constantly and joining communities and following people and focusing on something, even small something to get started and collecting information will improve uh, your practice uh, tremendously. And of course, visiting the new ways of teaching resources and learn from all the things which are there. Um, so uh, I would like the um, audience now to, to think about how do you structure your CBD? Uh, or do you structure your CBD? Any of the ideas shared uh, here will help you start structuring your CBD, continuous professional development. Do you, are you part of an ELT community? Would you like to join uh, an ELT community? There's a British Council community that's con constantly people posting ideas and events. Uh, this is a, some of the things teachers normally do, which is uh, starting a course, um, joining a community, presenting, which is quite a challenge at first, but then it's a very enriching experience to share sharing with colleagues uh, online or face to face. So we are coming up to the end of um, our wonderful webinar on professional development with three enthusiastic and experienced speakers today. And we would like to invite the audience as well to participate in this last part of the webinar. And that is, we'll like to create uh, a list of top CPD activities, the top activities that worked for you. So I will try to write ideas from speakers and ideas from the audience to make up a list here that we will share later probably yeah, in, a, in the recording and in uh, an infographics. So uh, Gary, would you like to share with us your first top tips for CPD? I mean, yeah, I mean, my my sort of my my main tip is, uh, you know, my I suppose my first and second tips are kind of very much connected. I mean, is is get involved uh, with other people um, and uh, whether that be via a specific teachers association or, or working with with teachers in your school, you know, just just get engaged and and, and talk to other people a bit like uh, Fatima was saying about, you know, uh, you know, having a, a you know, a, a chat over a, a cup of coffee, for example, but but a bit more formal than that. But I think, you know, if you can uh, join a, 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 a local or a regional or even a national or even an international organisation, uh, you know, I think I think it, it benefits a great deal. So, you know, connect with other teachers in some kind of way, maybe through a teachers association. Sorry. Over to you, uh, <laughs> Jose. Um, I think connecting definitely. Um, like I love staff room talk. Staff rooms are a, a wonderful place 
of, um, you know, of finding questions that you can later on research and discuss and find solutions. But I think something that we need to do is uh, also to share. Share what you know, connect with us and share. Um, don't think that you don't have anything to don't don't think that you have don't have anything uh, you know important to say. I mean, I remember my first um, practice, my first conference. I had I'd been teaching for five years, and uh, for me it was I felt very intimidated, especially when I saw you know different colleagues who I had spoken to in the past, and they've been very helpful and supportive, and they were there. So, um, but I still we still can all share important things with everybody. And Fatima, what do you think? Uh, I totally second your opinion, you and Gary, of course, but be more specific. I would advise people to go into vlogging, V-L-O-G-G-I-N-G. -G -G. So it's it's not just blogging, like typing and writing. If so, if you like writing, that's fine. If you if you like to, uh, you know, maybe write for um, a magazine or something, but you, you can start the first thing into blogging. And then the second thing, if you you're not really that kind of person who likes to type and would like to talk to people and engage, go into vlogging, YouTube thing, uh, cascade your knowledge through short videos, short clips that could be posted through uh, um, whatsoever means of social media communication like Telegram. It's the new it nowadays or uh, even, you know, um, uh, Facebook, uh, a short clip, start your own Facebook page as a teacher, somebody or a teacher trainer, somebody who is there to help novice teachers or maybe to help learners, your own learners starting. I mean, it's the, the opportunities on social media is quite endless. Um, I, I even, you know, uh, although I'm quite intimidated by it because it seems the new it for younger generation, which is TikTok go into TikTok. That's, you know, if you want to reach the younger generation, those who are really into the technology and know it, go into TikTok, do some vlogging through the TikTok. Maybe I'm advising myself here, but yes, vlogging, blogging. Yes. Thank you, Gary, Maria Jose and, and Fatima and Graham, I don't know if there are ideas from from the chat that we can add to the list. Yes, Alicia, we have had some ideas coming in. Sushma Gulia, so excuse me, Sushma, Sushma Gulia says pairing an experienced or successful or productive teacher with a new uh, a new teacher is a suggestion that you can add to the list. Um, we have uh, some questions mixed in as well, but being part of a project based learning PBL experience, project based learning experience at school is suggested by someone who um, did not give their name. Um, and then we have some people echoing what Gary said, for example, of just getting involved. John Verlin um, said getting involved um, as a person who belongs to a teacher association. So many learning opportunities present themselves. Um, and I think that is probably it. Let me see. There's a couple more just come in. Ah, yes, yeah, Nora. Said. Nora said get involved in a mentoring program. Um, Graham, you said project based learning was the previous one. Yes, project based learning. Okay. And then the final okay. one was Nora who said get involved in mentoring. Yeah, also mentioned by, by Gary here today. Yeah. That's like he said that young teachers, uh, novice and experienced teachers mentor each other <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, anything to add, Graham, to this list? Um, there's one more just come in as well. Um, the longer we do this, the more they'll come in. And um, people, please keep sharing uh, your tips. Um, if nothing else, you can see, you can read people's tips if we don't have a chance to share it um, in the audio, um, in the chat. 
but uh, engaging and maintaining collaborative relationships with other teachers is um, another tip that's come in anonymous uh, anonymously. Um, and this tip says not only from your own school or your country. So I think the idea is to connect with people as we're doing today. I think this is a good example of that from all over the world. In fact, you know, um, we have most of our audience from the Americas, so people are connecting with with us and other teachers um, from there, but we also have people from from other parts of the world as well, which is wonderful to see. Great, thank you, Graham. So now we can move on to our final announcements. Yeah, uh, before going to the question and answer. So you can think uh, of any questions you'd like to ask our speakers um, after these brief announcements. Again, to remind you to sign up to the New Ways of Teaching newsletter. Uh, Graham will share the link in the chat for you to access to what's already there, the podcasts, the videos, the webinars, but also uh, to, to get to know and be updated on all the publications that are to come, which are several and very interesting on several topics of your interest. And another reminder is that the next webinar is on climate change in English language education. Um, and I don't know if Ralph would like to step in here and invite uh, teachers to, I don't know, share their lesson plans or the lesson plans that they've already used uh, on the website. I don't know if Ralph's around. Most definitely, yes, I'm here. Uh, let me turn on my camera. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you, uh, the, the, the people that have registered for the uh, October uh, webinar most likely have received already in their emails um, an invitation to submit any evidence of work they've done with the climate change lesson plans that the British Council has provided. Um, so please have a look at that, uh, at those lesson plans. If you um, if you try those lesson plans in your classroom, you can tell us about the results that you obtain. And uh, if you are selected, you may hey, you may have a, a presenter role here in our next uh, 20th October webinar. We would really love to hear from you teachers uh, about the experience you've had with these um, lesson plans on climate change. They are great resources to bring to life those discussions, those uh, those current topics in, in climate change with your students. So we really encourage all of you to uh, try the lesson plans and uh, tell us about your experience. If you go to the New Ways of Teaching website and you go to the October um, event, you will find a link there uh, to um, a document, a form where you can input your data and say, hey, I tried this lesson plan. It was great. I tried, these are my students, blah, blah, blah. And this is the impact that the lesson had, etc. Right? There's a there's an example, a sample little paragraph that you can send us. So that should help you uh, structure more or less your testimonial. Right, we'll go then through a selection process, and as I said, we expect you to be, you know, a presenter in um, our October event. That's all from me. Thank you, Thank Alicia. You. Thank you, Ralph. That's very interesting. So please don't miss the next webinar and participate in this engaging proposal. Uh, there are other events. Just pick one and register for the coming events. One more thing, Teachers' Day is coming, the World Teacher Day on the 5th of October. There are a number of webinars uh, organized by Teaching uh, Teach English, Teaching English, so uh, the link will be shared in the chat. There are a number of keynote speakers that will be delivering from the 7th, from the 5th, sorry, to the 8th of October, webinars on different topics. And now we don't have much time, but uh, there's a question and answer 
uh, before coming, before closing the event. Graham, over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so for we have lots of questions. We've been getting questions in um, all, all through the webinar. Just before we, uh, I start with the questions. I put the link in the um, in the question and answer box. Made an announcement where people can register to get their certificate for today's webinar. Um, so please go ahead and do that um, at your leisure. I'll put it in again after the uh, the question and answers. So I'm going to scroll right up to the beginning. And I don't know which one of our um, guest speakers today would like to take this question, but um, let me see. Where can I find the real concept of professional development? Well, what 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 do you think either uh, Gary, Fatima or Mario Jose related to this? What's the sort of how would you define continuing professional development. Is there any one way of doing it? I think the answer is no, but um, you shared quite a lot uh, of suggestions today, but um, how do people start and how how could they choose? How do they decide what to do? There's a question for you. Can I answer that one? Please sure. do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, I'll, I'll be practical here. I'll tell you this. Go to the British Council website. Uh, you would find that, uh, that clickable window there that says professional development for teachers. There are uh, two bars, uh, one that you can take on your own and the other which is the formal qualification thing. If you are really a novice teacher and you can afford it, you can start with the SILTA. That's the right thing to do. But if you would like to learn on your own and you would like to um, understand more about the ELT community, I would advise you to again go to the British Council website. You would find the CPD wheel I talked to you about. You would find the PDF explaining it more, telling you what does each part of this mean and how to get more information and understanding and gaining understanding of these. But also keep in mind that uh, uh, the area that you need to find is always available online, but go to the right resource like the British Council website. That's the one that I guarantee that you can find everything that you need in. But also MOOCs like the Future Learn courses that uh, are targeting novice teachers and experienced ones as well and courses that targeting stuff like online learning and all these kind of things. So that is, in, in short, continuous professional development, which is finding your niche, find the thing that you like, learn more about it, experiment with it in the classroom. But that's it for me. Thank you very much, Fatima. And um, let me move to another question now. Um, so uh, we have one from scrolling up here one from um i'm just coming across lots of tips here sorry uh someone who is asking about gary i think it's it's more of a comment but appreciating gary's idea of getting involved with the teaching association here we have it so milton sandrea from venezuela um, ask the question today. Most of the students do not listen to teachers. What do you do to motivate them as a result of them being at home? So do you have any suggestions? Not really CPD, but it is definitely something that is on Milton's uh, mind. Does anyone have any suggestions of how best to motivate students who are at home and who may well be bored or um, need some kind of and help. Well, I can I can answer that. Great, thank you. Um, this is something that I've struggled with a lot as well, so I I do feel your pain. Um, we have been back face to face for a while, but I did have three months online. Um, first of all, is we need to take us look at ourselves and think: Are we motivated when we are doing the online lessons? Um, 
I don't know about you, but online teaching when I mean online, I mean like through video conferencing and things, it takes more energy. So it's like we give out more of ourselves in. So we're trying to transmit some passion and what we enjoy. So um, and also I think that a, a huge um, disadvantage of online learning in the sense of the beliefs that people believe. And one of the things that I remember at when I did my master's at University of Manchester, one of the things they said is our our certificates do not have online teaching, online learning that you I was an external student. They didn't say that because it was just as valid as if I had been there face to face. And this is something that we need to be able to do as teachers. Can we create the same, uh, you know, can we increase the level? Can we try to increase the sense of that it, there's a purpose for online learning? It's not that it's just OK, everything is online and that's it and I don't have to worry. It's is there a purpose of a task? So we need to be able to see, help them see that even though they're at home, it doesn't mean that they don't they, they can't continue to learn. Of course, it do, that doesn't mean to bombard them and give them a lot of work because it is very tiring. Remember that it's not just our subject, but it's all the other subjects across the curriculum that are also online. But just to make sure that you, you don't go too soft nor too hard and continue enjoying and don't just think about online teaching through video conferencing. You know, if there's if you have a platform at school, use that to send messages. Hi, everybody, and maybe start a forum so that they can talk. You know, they can type. Don't just depend on the video conferencing um, for that moment to motivate. Try to motivate them through messaging and trying to build a community because I mean, I was a, I was an I've been an external student as well, and one of the things that I've loved is the teachers, the professors at the university were able to create those communities, and I think that's a huge, that was a huge, you know, benefit for me, and this is something we need to replicate for our students as well. Thank you very much, Mary Jose. Um, Gary, Can I say something there as well. On. Yes, of course. I, I was going to turn to you, but some... you, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, it, it reminds me of one of the things that you said, Graham, uh, many years ago that uh, and it's also in one of your books, uh, I think, uh, where you talk about uh, game based learning. And I think it doesn't really matter whether it's online or face to face. It's actually engaging with students where they're at. So you talked about a conversation you you overheard um, uh, uh, from uh, you know a couple of students who were talking about the games that they were playing uh, at the weekend and you use that as a way of uh, engaging them in the classroom so it's finding real ways to engage with students uh, and I think that's you know a, a really key key and important thing whether it's face to face or or, or at a distance it's trying to you know uh, find things that that interest the students um, and that's not always uh, the, the material that's in the textbook unfortunately uh, I realize that but but you know you know it, it's it's looking beyond uh, you know that you know that sort of traditional sort of teacher pupil relationship to something that becomes more uh, of an engagement and I think that makes a lot of difference I just thought I'd throw that in because I've always been impressed by that Graham as an idea Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I think um, I think as teachers grow in experience and they they diverge from course book materials or um, I think when you first start teaching, it's always tempting just to stick very rigidly to the book or the course. And then I think as you as you grow in experience, I think you realize so long as you are able to help the students learn, then you can really, uh, you know, as you say, find interesting topics that are perhaps outside of the the, the course materials, but that um, are very engaging for the students. I'm going to keep you on the screen there, Gary. Just um, I think I know the answer to this. I think um, I think it's not a difficult question, but Matilda <laughs> Patterson from Villa Clara in Cuba. Um, she says that professional development is lifelong. When should teachers start? So uh, she trains future English teachers and she wants them to start thinking about development early. But, um, you know, she didn't want to overwhelm them, I think. Um, 
and some people believe professional development should start immediately after graduation, others not so. Do you have any views about that? I mean, I, it, it's yeah, it is difficult when you're on an initial training course to 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 be thinking about you know a, a sort of professional development perhaps, but but I I, I think that's uh, mistaken. I think the earlier that you can get involved in, the earlier that you're introduced to things beyond uh, the, the, the actual specific training that you go through joining your professional community, uh, the, the better really. I mean, I mean, it, it, it took me a, a little bit of time um, to, to, to join an organisation, uh, but, but you know, I, I, I was within about a year of me, me training that, that I, I didn't even know about uh, organisations like IATFL. I didn't know they existed, but the moment I found them, uh, you know, I thought, well, this is this is great. I can join them, and I started attending sessions, and and I didn't look back really. So I think introducing those things, you don't have to do it in a heavy way, but uh, introduce people, maybe get somebody in from a local organisation, or run a webinar, uh, connect with uh, you know uh, other organisations like the British Council that that do these things, and and get people engaged. Just signpost them to it, and 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 and, and then you know if you keep in contact with your students after courses. You know, keep sending them information. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very good advice, uh, Gary. I'm going to hand over finally to Alicia to wrap things up now um, because we've come to the end of uh, time. Thank you, everybody, everybody for coming. Thank you to our guest speakers as well. Thank you, Graham. Just a reminder that they can get the certificate of attendance and by scanning this code or clicking on the link shared by Graham some minutes ago uh, before the question and answer and he'll be sharing it again and of course thanking you all for joining us in this webinar thanking the speakers for so many wonderful ideas for the enthusiasm they are uh, an inspiration for all teachers leaders and policy makers that attended the webinar today. Thank you, Graham, again. And OK, see you next webinar then, next month. <laughs>